Hey everyone, it's Saoirse. You'll have to excuse my voice today, it probably sounds a little bit weird. I just got back from hiking the West Highland Way and um, I was freezing and soaked a lot of the time. <laughs> Thank you Scottish weather in July. And so I got a bit of a cold and um, my throat is a little bit sore, so bear with me. Talking is strange to say the least. But um, I read a book last week um, before I left for the hike and I wanted to talk to you about that now that I've got time. And that book is The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. And so Ishiguro won the Nobel Prize in Literature. And this book, it says it won the Booker Prize. This is serious stuff. I mean, truly a writer's dream. Um, this was published in 1988, if I didn't say that. And I read um, Never Let Me Go and Very Giant, two of his other novels. And I, I really loved Never Let Me Go. At first I wasn't quite sure about it, but it had this sort of like feeling throughout it that you can't really name. And then, I don't know, it was just devastating. And The Very Giant... Um, because I had read Never Let Me Go, I thought I would like The Very Giant, and I really didn't enjoy it. Um, something perhaps about the, um, I don't know if it was allegorical nature or, um, I don't know, the characters didn't work for me, but I, so I was disappointed because I, I'd really liked the other one. Um, so I thought, you know, I'll give, I'll give him another try, and um, I found this one to be sort of in the middle of those two for me. It wasn't... There was nothing I really disliked about it. Um, uh, it wasn't, you know, stunning to me, but it, there, there is a lot in here that is, you know, deeply moving when you look at it and um, says a lot, I think, about what we do to, um, to get by in a world where we maybe aren't allowed to be ourselves entirely and um, to the point where we never even learn who we are. I don't know, that's kind of what I got out of it. But, um, I'll just read the back for you. The Remains of the Day is a profoundly compelling portrait of the perfect English butler and of his fading insular world in post-war England. At the end of his three decades of service at Darlington Hall, Stevens embarks on a country drive during which he looks back over his career to reassure himself that he has served humanity by serving a great gentleman. But lurking in his memory are doubts about the true nature of Lord Darlington's greatness and graver doubts about his own faith in the man he served. So, yeah, it, it takes place um, within a few days. You know, it's all, it's a very, like, short, um, narrative space, but it uh, uses flashbacks throughout the whole book. So while he's driving to, he's going to Cornwall, um, this butler, Stevens, is reflecting on the things that happened uh, while he was working for this man, Lord Darlington, um, before World War II. Um, so it's it's sectioned in, in like, day one, evening, Salisbury, and, um, so you see him, like, go through the countryside, uh, throughout the book, um, day two, afternoon, and the very interesting thing about this book, like, more so than the plot or, or what it was trying to do, uh, the, the narration was fascinating to me because it's written it you would start reading it and you would think this is written in past tense with even more um, past flashbacks but it's 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 written in present tense um, and it's so subtly done and it's so shocking when you realize it but it's like he'll say things like like he says I lodged last night in an inn you know, last night, it's as if it's a diary, you know, and that's, that's the reason I love, like, um, diary or epistolary, uh, forms of writing, because 
you are living in that moment as you're writing that letter or that diary entry, but you can talk about things that happened previously. Um, you can talk about things that are going to happen, which with, you know, just, um, mm, with just past tense, you're limited. And I think, like even just doing, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of present tense anymore. I used to only write in present tense and then I realized it just, it doesn't, it's very hard to make it not sound cheesy. Um, but the way that he does it is so, it's so well done and this is what I like about Ishiguro is his subtlety and um, it's just, I don't know, like you don't even realize what's happening and, and then you're like, oh, you've been taking me on this this journey not only with, with the story but with your writing. Um, so I love that like even though it never says you know, this is a diary, it never says he's writing this for any particular purpose um, and it makes you wonder, um, I always think that with narration, like when it's first person, are they, like while he's sitting on a bench by a pond, is he thinking all of these words and that's becoming the narration, or is he literally writing them down and that's the narration and he's saying this is going to happen tomorrow and um, this is what happened this morning, but right now I'm on this bench. Uh, it's it's very interesting to me. Um, I don't know, as a writer it's it's always like difficult to find the balance of um, where I want to be in time, where I want to tell the story from, and um, how to keep a narration progressing. Um, in an interesting way. <sighs> so many thoughts. Yeah. So I mostly write in past tense now, but I, as I said, I feel pretty limited because you you can't talk about things that are... I don't know, I guess you could do the thing that I hate, which is like, um, this thing happened and years later I would find out that this was really the case. I really don't like when people do that. Um, but anyway, I, I could probably ramble about that and just, you know, different writing tenses for a very long time, but let's, let's not do that right now. I'll just read you a few quotes in here. Um, so this book overall is, is this butler talking about his life and his past um, and his relationship, not, re I mean, not relationship, but like, um, you know, friendship, whatever, working relationship with Miss Kenton. I really hope I remember that name right. Um, and... Sorry, I'm just learning how to whistle. Um, so yeah, he's throughout the whole book kind of giving us definitions of like, what is a good butler, what is dignity, what is greatness? and the things that he's done to prove to himself that he has been a good butler, that he has served a good man, that he has nothing to be ashamed of, um, despite his, you know, the person that he worked for, his um, involvement with some things that are very unsavory um, regarding the lead up to World War II. And um, so yeah, it really reads like this kind of I don't want to say manifesto, like, uh, just just a nice thought process of one man driving through the countryside trying to convince himself that his life has not been a waste and that um, he can do what he wants to with the remains of his day. Um, day meaning life. Okay, so let's just read this one. Um, he talks about like what, what his employer expects from him. It is quite possible then that my employer fully expects me to respond to his bantering in a like manner and considers my failure to do so a form of negligence. This is, as I say, a matter which has given me much concern. But I must say this business of bantering is not a duty I feel I can ever discharge with enthusiasm. It is all very well in these changing times to adapt one's work to take in duties not traditionally within one's realm. But bantering is of another dimension altogether. 
For one thing, how would one know for sure that at any given moment a response of the bantering sort is truly what is expected? One need hardly dwell on the catastrophic possibility of uttering a bantering remark, only to discover it wholly inappropriate. So this, this whole theme of bantering, it, it starts at the beginning of the book, and it, it goes throughout the whole thing. Um, and it's, it's so sad that this man, he has to, you know, alter the way that he acts. He's already altered it by, you know, learning how to speak, um, like, the proper English of, a, of an English butler. And everything about him is so controlled and so performative, I guess. Um, and now he has to add this other thing to his, um you know, roster of skills that he, he has to employ to, um, to be a good butler. And this is with his new employer after, uh, Lord Darlington is gone. So, um, it's an American called, um, Mr. Faraday. And that's how the book starts with Mr. Faraday being the new employer. And so the book is actually set, um, in 1956, but most of the action takes place in the 30s, I want to say. Um, so yeah, just really, really depressing, um, this whole banter thing. And him, you know, you can just see him trying to, trying to keep up and like trying to, he's, he's spent his entire life, you know, watching his father and now him try to be in this role where there's so much expected of them, and yet there people still think so little of them because they're not nobility themselves, they're not, you know, true gentlemen. Um, anyway. I'm rambly today. I hope you can hear me too. Okay, I just liked this part. The English landscape at its finest such as I saw it this morning, possesses a quality that the landscapes of other nations, however more superficially dramatic, inevitably fail to possess. It is, I believe, a quality that will mark out the English landscape to any objective observer as the most deeply satisfying in the world, and this quality is probably best summed up by the term greatness. For it is true, when I stood on that high ledge this morning and viewed the land before me, I distinctly felt that rare yet unmistakable feeling the feeling that one is in the presence of greatness. We call this land of ours Great Britain, and there may be those who believe this is somewhat immodest practice, yet I would venture that the landscape of our country alone would justify the use of this lofty adjective. I just like that because I love, I love the landscape of England. Um, and, you know, Scotland's beautiful too, but there's something about it when I when I go down to England that I just I don't know it's just so soft and pretty and I don't know you know how it is the rolling hills and the and the patchwork quilt farms and you know when you take a train journey um, along the coast you see you know gentle cliffs and the sea um, it's just a beautiful beautiful country more. What? Um, oh, this is another uh, bantering thing. I had been rather pleased with my witticism when it had first come into my head, and I must confess I was slightly disappointed it had not been better received than it was. I was particularly disappointed, I suppose, because I have been devoting some time and effort over recent months to improving my skill in this very area. That is to say, I have been endeavouring to add this skill to my professional armory, so as to fulfil with confidence all Mr. Faraday's expectations with respect to bantering. He's spending all this time, you know, changing who he is. It, you get the idea that it's like... It's it's kind of like a, an older person now suddenly having to, like, learn how to use Facebook and Instagram. Like, they've learned things a certain way and then everything has suddenly changed. Um, and, and it's this constant race to keep up and to be what everyone expects of you. 
because times change and you have to change with them. Um, let's see. Okay, this is the last thing I'll read. Um, I personally knew at least two professionals, both of some ability, who went from one employer to the next, forever dissatisfied, never settling anywhere, until they drifted from view altogether. That this should happen is not the least surprising, for it is in practice simply not possible to adopt such a critical attitude towards an employer and at the same time provide good service. It is not simply that one is unlikely to be able to meet the many demands of service at the higher levels while one's attentions are being diverted by such matters. More fundamentally, a butler who is forever attempting to formulate his own strong opinions on his employer's affairs is bound to lack one quality essential in all good professionals, namely loyalty. So he has to tell himself that he has been a good butler because he has been loyal, because he hasn't questioned his employer's um, questionable deeds. Um, and it's, it's just so sad because it's like, I don't know, I always think this about, about um, people who work in service, you, especially, you know, this old, old timey, you know, Downton Abbey style um, version of service with the butlers and maids and footmen and everything. You, do you have your own life? You, you, you have to, I mean, often they lived in the houses where they worked and you know, they wake up, they take care of all of their duties for this person that they work for and then they go to sleep and it's and it just makes me so sad. I don't know, and then he spends his only, you know, free time trying to work on banter and um, improving his speech and and everything is just everything is just with this goal of serving this one person or this family and um, being able to tell yourself at the end of the day that that what you've done was worth it and that you've done a good job. Um, and uh, a theme in this book, I'd say, is uh, uh, daddy issues. Um, because we see his father um, growing older and deteriorating and they, they hardly have any relationship, they can barely speak to each other, it's so stiff, it's so formal. And um, it's just, it's so sad to see, like you think, Stevens is definitely, you know, hoping to be as great of a man as he thinks his father is, but he probably never tells his father he thinks he's great or tells him that he wishes he was proud of him. Um, it's just, it's like you have to be too formal to have emotions and there is this, you know, English restraint which I think is very um, commonly talked about thing. The English are um, notoriously restrained um, in terms of emotions. I mean, that doesn't apply to everybody in England, but, you know, that's like a stereotype. Um, and it's, you can see in this book, like, how that can be so debilitating, because you can tell that, obviously, he has, has always had feelings for Miss Kenton, the housekeeper at Darlington Hall. Um, and it's, and it's a very kind of like, if you've seen Downton Abbey, a Carson and Mrs. Hughes sort of um, vibe where you're just like throughout the whole thing just thinking, get together, just get together. Why are you, why are you not together? You guys love each other. Um, and so he spends all this, this time driving to see Miss Kenton. And I won't tell you what happens, but... Um, it's just, you know, through the flashbacks with them, you, you just get so frustrated. Like, why can't you just, you know, be nicer to her, tell her how you feel, stop putting your ridiculous duty ahead of your heart. Um, yeah. So definitely very sad. And I love the quote on the back here from Newsweek, brilliant and quietly devastating. I think quietly devastating is like what I aspire 
um, to you with my writing and it is what I love to read. I, I just, I adore things that are quietly devastating, things that just like slowly and silently kill me and destroy me. That is, that's the kind of literature that I enjoy. Um, so, I think I will <sighs> rest for a little bit longer. I'm, I'm so just physically ugh, from hiking. That, that trail is so rough on the feet. I mean, I can barely stand still. My feet are so messed up right now. Um, so maybe it would be a good time to just, you know, like chill out and read another book. I'm not sure what I want to read next though. I'm thinking, I was thinking something non-fiction since I just read fiction. Um, so maybe like I have uh, In Cold Blood, um, I have a lot of like true crime things like The Stranger Beside Me, um, but then I've also kind of been wanting to read Lolita because I've had it for a bit and you know, I'm classic and I've never read it so. Um, but I've also got some Jane Austen and ooh, Bill Bryson. Ooh, that's really tempting because that is something I can like easily just chill out with and um, it's just like his writing's very easy to, um, not that it doesn't make you think, but like you, it's easy to work with. Um, so oh, that might be a nice, a nice distraction from my current ah, like I'm I'm leaving, <laughs> I'm leaving the UK in a few weeks. I'm going back to Florida. Why? I can somebody tell me? I don't know. Um, I just didn't really know what else to do, you know, um, my visa's not done yet, but, um, the semester's done, I'm turning in my dissertation, like, next week, oh my god, oh my god, I should probably, like, look through it one more time, ah. um, and then, yeah, I'll be done with my master's, it's very exciting, so then I guess I just thought, like, what am I sticking around for, um, I don't know, um, I'm excited to go home and see family and friends and all that, but oh, it'll be sad to leave, it will, but you know what, just another adventure coming around the corner, I'm sure, it's always something else, oh my knee hurts so bad, it hurts so bad, um, not because I'm old, just because I was hiking, but also because my knees are bad, maybe I am old, anyway. I will talk to you all next time with whatever book I choose to read next. We probably only have a couple more videos going to happen um, in this flat here in Edinburgh, Scotland. And then hopefully I will be able to build up my new library with all of my books that have been in storage in Florida um, in my new house, which will be thrilling. So see you next time. I'm gonna go drink a lot of water. <laughs>